Hi, everyone. Yes, thank you so much, Patricia. We got for you a great panel of speakers today, all speaking on uh, different topics. Um, and just before we get started, I just wanted to, to share that uh, we have a lifelong learning track at the MIT Club of Northern California. And so for those of you um, who either want to learn more about our talks similar to, to this Neuroscience Lightning Talk or want to be a speaker, please feel free to contact me. My uh, uh, email uh, information is on the, uh, on the slide here. Uh, we do have a SETI Institute uh, talk coming up on February 3rd, where the, the CEO of the SETI Institute and seven scientists would talk about their research that's related to uh, the <clears throat> search for and uh, understanding life beyond Earth. So that's coming up on February 3rd uh, for everyone to sign up. Uh, now, without further ado, we got a great panel of, uh, uh, of speakers. Um, and I wanna make sure to give them the full time, but just a very quick uh, introduction. Um, Irina Schuyler Scott, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Irina Schuyler Scott, I should say, uh, is uh, course nine, uh, class of 2009. Uh, she'll be giving a talk on maintaining brain health, a practical approach to successful aging. Uh, then we've got uh, Ricky, Dr. Ricky Savjani, uh, who is a physician at UCLA in radiation oncology, as well as a research fellow at Varian Medical Systems. Uh, he uh, was also course nine and, and course uh, six two as well. And he'll be talking to us about finding the map of eye movements inside the human brainstem. And last but not, not least, we got Elizabeth Ricker, who uh, was course nine <clears throat> as well. Uh, and she uh, will be uh, initiating us as a neurohacker uh, through a short self-experiment. So I'll uh, give more uh, intros to, to each of the speakers as they come on, but we, I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Irina Schuyler Scott. Um, she uh, has been working on uh, Alzheimer's research, and uh, basically her research focuses around um, you know, a third of Alzheimer's diseases cases worldwide are estimated to be at least partly attributable to seven modifiable factors. Um, and so furthermore, studies have identified practical lifestyle modifications that can affect cognitive function and risk of cognitive decline. So her talk will focus on preventative strategies to improve and maintain cognitive function and decrease the likelihood of impairment. And without further ado, Irina, please take it over. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, excited to be here. Let me share my screen. So just a moment here. I'm sorry. If you hear some outside noise, that's my son. But hopefully it's cute rather than annoying. Uh, just a second here. Who happens to be MIT baby. Because both <laughs> Irina and her husband uh, went to MIT. Okay, here we go. So my interest is how we can age successfully and maintain our brain health. And I'm including my email address here because I'm always open to questions, ideas, potential collaborations. So if you're interested in uh, brain health across the cognitive spectrum from people who are cognitively normal all the way to people who go on to develop dementias, feel free to reach out anytime. Um, so first, I just want to distinguish between this idea of resistance and resilience. So resistance is avoiding brain pathology. It could be Alzheimer's disease pathology or any pathology related to dementias. And then there's this concept of related concept of resilience, which is coping with pathology that you already have. As we age, we all go on to develop a little bit of pathology, uh, you know, that's highly variable, but I'm interested in how you can uh, stay cognitively normal or relatively com cognitively unimpaired compared with your peers um, when you go on to develop this pathology. So first, I just wanted to share with you a study that looked at a thousand people and followed them over time until they passed away, and then they did autopsies on these participants to relate their degree of pathology to their cognition. And what you can see is that, um, you know, although there's a clear relationship between pathology that people uh, uh, develop and their cognitive scores or their memory oh, scores, um, that there's a, on. there's a lot of noise in this data. You know, it's, there's a quite a bit of uh, variability. So for example, uh, 
if you look at a global pathology score of two, there are people who did quite well on their cognitive scores. Um, whereas, um, and, and it's sort of interesting to think about what distinguishes these people, these high performers versus the people who don't perform as well. And the, this, this group looked at this a little bit. What they found is that uh, both reading level and past cognitive activity was related to your level of resilience. Um, but interestingly, early life socioeconomic status was not related, and nor was your APOE4 status. APOE4 is an allele, a genetic allele, that confers increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. So uh, let's dive a little bit deeper into this idea of past cognitive activity. So this was a study looking at 200 participants who were cognitively unimpaired, and um, they asked them about what past cognitive activity they did, both when they were age 6, 12, 18, and 40, as well as what they do in the present, whether it's reading a newspaper, reading magazines, reading books, and so forth. And what they found is that your past cognitive activity was related to your current scores on um, different uh, domains of cognition. So they looked at executive function, which is your ability to organize, plan, problem solve, multitask, switch from one task to another, memory scores, and then processing speed. And they also found that your current activities in that regard had a relationship with those scores. Uh, interestingly, self-report of past exercise, were those, those graphs were pretty flat overall, although there's a lot of good evidence to suggest that your lifetime Physical activity has a really important um, bears has a lot of importance in terms of your cognition. But your uh, what your cur their current um, physical activity, as measured by uh, pedometer data, was related to these different cognitive domains. So I think I hope you find it reassuring and kind of uplifting that there are things you can do in your life uh, and across your lifetime to really benefit your cognition overall. Um, also interesting that the scores were a little bit flat when they looked at the relationship between these reports of cognitive activity and uh, pathology. So PIB refers to the accumulation of amyloid, one of the proteins that accumulates in Alzheimer's disease. Precuneus FTG looks at sugar breakdown. Sugar breakdown is not as good in people who have a pathology in their brain. And then hippocampal volume refers to people who, um, uh, the, the volume of the memory centers in your brain. And I think one reason this might be is that if they looked at this longitudinally, they might find stronger relationships that we don't see um, in this kind of cross-sectional data. But um, I think all of you might be interested in what specific cognitive activities we should be doing and of all the things that we could do, what we might focus on. So this group looked at uh, over, um, you know, they started out with 5,800 participants and then they wanted to make sure everybody was cognitively normal um, and that they had follow-ups. So ultimately they ended up with 2000 whom they followed over five years to see whether they went on to develop MCI, which is mild cognitive impa impairment. Basically this idea of having objective impairments on your cognitive tests, but not quite at the level of a dementia yet. And um, so they looked at um, what people did in midlife, in late life or in both. And if you look, um, computer, uh, so these are hazard ratios. So you wanna see lower scores. That means that they confer some benefit. There's less of a hazard in terms of developing MCI. So, um, you know, computer use was quite good in all three um, categories, but you have to keep in mind that this was an older patient population. So maybe computer use was a little bit more cognitively taxing in this group than it might be uh, for all of us. So, you know, we'll have to repeat the study <laughs> when we're all older. Um, but um, books really convert a benefit late in life. And maybe that's because you could, this is just a hypothesis, that it becomes cognitively more taxing as you get older. And so kind of uh, it's a better activity um, late in life, whereas it's much more of a passive activity earlier in life. But certainly if you talk to other people about the books or get into debates about them, then you're adding the amount of um, cognitive load and then that is potentially more beneficial. Crafts were helpful late in life in particular or across the lifespan. Games were helpful throughout. These were largely things like card games, bridge, um, but, and you can see why that would be helpful. Or you can hypothesize that there's you know, you're, you're, you're doing, you're, there's so, a social engagement element to it, as well as um, uh, a cognitive load, because you're trying to strategize as you play the games. 
But, um, and then social engagement was quite helpful late in life too. And that's something that we certainly encourage or I encourage my patients to do because um, as people get older, sometimes they become more reticent. They stop calling their friends, stop meeting up with people. And there's a, lo a lot of good data to suggest that maintaining social engagement is really important for your brain health. So is more better? The answer is probably yes. Uh, so they looked at whether you, if you did uh, more than one cognitive activity, did that seem to improve? And the, as you can see, the hazard ratio really got better as you went up with the number of activities that you did. Uh, although, you know, the hazard ratio for five activities was a little worse than four. I'm sure the authors of this paper were a little upset to see the break in their pattern. But overall, um, it is a pretty clear trend in that direction. So this is a long, boring slide. It's meant to make your eyes glaze over on purpose. Basically, what I, um, the point here is that with regard to things like cognitive training, I get a lot of questions about this. You know, can you do specific cognitive training things, computer-based tasks that improve your memory? And the data is really variable. So some of the studies show no significant benefit. Some of them show modest benefit. Some of them show significant improvement. And the overall conclusion of the field is largely um, that it confers benefit in terms of getting better on the task, if at all, but not in your actual life. The exception to this is the FINGER trial, which looked at a multi-domain approach. So they threw the kitchen sink and at you and they tried to uh, look at a lot of different variables. Um, and they it was a two-year double-blind randomized control trial in Finland. And they, um, they had a diet intervention, an exercise intervention, cognitive training, vascular monitoring, and then the control group just had general health advice. And um, just to skip ahead in the interest of time, because I only have eight minutes, is um, um, that they had essentially close to 600 groups in each modified intention to treat group, the intervention group and control. I'm happy to define that in the Q&A if there's interest. Um, and so this is a little bit more about the interventions that they did, happy to talk about that more. Now I'm stalling to uh, build up the tensions to get you excited about the result of this study, but, uh, um, essentially what they found is that in, if you do throw the kitchen sink at people and you follow them over time, then their performance on cognitive scores does not decline uh, to the degree that it would over time in a controlled group that's just getting generalized health advice. And that's true in uh, the case of processing speed. It's true in the case of memory scores. It's true um, with overall cognition. Um, over the two-year period. Oh, I'm sorry, it, it's true um, in overall scores, executive function and processing speed, but not with memory scores, which is interest, interesting. Although I've seen this in other literature as well, that it's really the executive function that determines in some way whether you're a cognitive maintainer, meaning um, that you are able to maintain a high performance over time. There's an interesting literature on super agers, people who perform at the top 10 or top 20% of their age group and, um, and, and the maintainers, those that can continue to perform at that high level. Um, and it's really that ability to organize, plan, and multitask that seems to determine that in some way. So um, the bottom line is that there are things that you can do to um, stave off cognitive decline or at least you know do your very best. The, 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 the list of things that you ought to be doing is on this slide. I'm happy to go into more detail in the Q&A uh, if there are any questions about this, uh, what a Mediterranean diet is, for example. But I wanna thank you all for uh, listening and, um, and um, I hope that I was able to make this, task, this talk as practical as possible so that you can contemplate some of this in your own life. Um, I'll Thank pause you. here. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. Answer for the Thank group? you so much, uh, Irina. Just in the interest of time, because we do have a strict um, like 30 minutes, what we can do is move the Q&A to the chat. So uh, for those of you, uh, if you want to just directly message Irina uh, Skylar Scott, uh, uh, your questions, and you know, we can then move on to the, to the next speak speaker so that they have enough time for their, for their speech as well. Sorry about that. I went a little long, I realized. Um, no, I so next well. we okay. have Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Ricky Savjani. So, um, Course nine again as he's getting his slides ready. Uh, I'm not going to give him the full intro, but um, you know he he is both a MD PhD um, where he practices and now doing research. So I pass it over to Dr. Sabjani. 
Great. Thank you, Wendy, uh, for having me on, on this session. This is fantastic. And, and thanks, Rina, for, for sharing that great information. So uh, yeah, my name is Ricky. Uh, I don't think I've joined this group before, but thanks thanks again for having me uh, for the MIT Global IEP Day. IEP was probably my most fun time in my life uh, in the four years that I was at MIT. Uh, so it's really exciting to present this. So I am a, I'm a resident in radiation oncology at UCLA, but I've had had opportunity to come up here in the Bay Area uh, this year to work with Varian, who's, who manufactures and develops uh, linear accelerators. And we're working on some interesting projects. But um, since there's a neuroscience focus, I wanted to talk a little bit about the work that we did uh, in graduate school and then how we're pro applying this to, to sort of radiation oncology now. Um, so in graduate school, the most fun project I had to work on was this, this structure in the brain called the superior colliculus. It looks like a butterfly. It's a uh, dime size, so it's extremely small. These, it's, a, it's a pair of mounds that lie at the very top of the brain stem. And um, if you look at what visual scientists study in the brain, they usually study this pathway. So in the back of the eye, there's a retina that goes into the thalamus, into this area called the lateral geniculate nucleus. And it goes into the back of the brain um, called the visual cortex or V1, this early visual cortex. And this is a pathway most people think about when they study it. But what, what we don't realize is it's kind of often overlooked is that there's this fibers that branch off of this pathway and they directly project onto this area called the superior colliculus. And that's what I'm gonna focus in on, on, on today. So the superior colliculus in many ways is like an onion uh, and an onion is a really good analogy way to think about how the superior colliculus is, is organized. So like, like an onion that has layers, the superior colliculus has layers and we can think of them largely as three layers. There's a superficial, intermediate and deep layer. It's a little bit more complex than this, but I think this is a good simplification. And um, you have direct projections that go from the retina directly to the superficial layer of the superior colliculus. But I actually want to go a little bit deeper and talk about the intermediate layer where there's these neurons that do something very interesting. And the interesting thing they do is they actually drive how your eyes make movement. So if you're taking a look at this picture of New York City, which once upon a time it looked like this, and uh, you would be jumping, you're making these eye movements that are jumping between people, taxi cab, building, and those are called saccades or rapid ballistic eye movements. And the superior colliculus generates these saccades. And we know this because in the 1970s, um, a lot of people did these really beautiful electrophysiology experiments in the monkeys. So they would dunk electrodes into these intermediate layers of the superior colliculus, and they could drive eye movements in the monkeys. And there's no computer, so they mapped this all out by hand, and all these drawings were done by hand. It's some of the most elegant work that was done in the 70s. And to simplify this work, we can take this flattened view of the superior colliculus and say, if I dunk my electrode here in, this, in the middle, I could drive an eye movement from the left FC into the right. So I can drive a contralateral eye movement. If I move that electrode now to the medial side of the superior colliculus, I could still drive a contralateral eye movement, but it's tilted superiorly. And similarly, if I moved it um, onto the lateral side, I can now drive the eye movement to, to contralaterally to the right, but also now inferiorly. So we can think that the, the medial lateral extent of the superior colliculus maps the inferior superior um, visual field in terms of eye movements. And we can also, in the 70s, they also done these really nice experiments where they dunk the electrodes and instead of you know, injecting current, they just measured the neuronal firing and you can see that their neuronal firing preceded the actual saccades. So these, these neurons are actually in charge of, of generating this. And this is all great. We can do this at, in the 1970s at the cellular level in monkeys, but how do we actually do this in humans? There's no electrocorticography, there's no deep brain stimulation that you're gonna actually access the brainstem because it's such a critical structure. So the only way to do it is non-invasively and we use functional MRI where we have, instead of measuring single neurons, we're measuring hundreds of thousands or millions of neurons with, um, with, with fMRI. But we were able to do this and, and we answered three questions, which is what does that map, that topography look like? How does that map relate to vision into that superficial layer? And then can we dig through the onion and find the different layers? And uh, this took some time to figure out what the right stimulus to, to present patients because of the complexity of, of how much the superior colliculus does, but ultimately we, we converged onto this experiment. So you see the sea of red dots and one of those dots will turn green. And as it turns green, we also have an intentional task so that we make sure that people are actually focused and doing the task uh, correctly and their attention is engaged by, they have to press a button, whether this is a circle or a square, and then this green dot is gonna jump, and they're gonna make that first saccade in that direction. And they're gonna make another saccade and another saccade till they reach the end of the visual screen. Then as they get there, they're gonna make a smooth pursuit back to the origin, 
and, and, and we're going to separate out smooth pursuits from saccades because the, the superior colliculus is really generating those rapid ballistic eye movements. And we're going to do these on three different principal angles, inferiorly tilted, horizontally tilted, and then superiorly tilted. So here's what it looks like. So this is actually my eye on the right, and I'm making these rapid saccades, 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 and I'm making a smooth pursuit back to the origin. And let me show you what it looks like at full speed. This is at, at, at one speed, one X speed now. It's saccades, saccades, saccades smooth pursuit back to the origin, and again, saccade, 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 and now I'm going to go back, but I'm going to now do the other direction. I'm going to tilt it to the other direction, and in this way, we can actually do this. We have to throw people in the scanner for two hours until their extraocular muscles physically hurt. It's like working them out, um, but this is the kind of paradigm that we need to get the, the because of this low signal-to-noise ratio in the brainstem of fMRI, we have to do this um, in a very repetitive, uh, stereotypical way, and so what does that map look like? In order to measure this with fMRI, we have to do a technique called phase, uh, phase encoding or phase mapping, which is that if we have these repetitive stereotypes, cyclical types of eye movements, we can actually um, um, pattern this out. So each voxel might care about a particular phase in this representation, and um, we can do this, we can sample all the possible phases or essentially do a fast Fourier transform on this. And each voxel now can correspond to a particular phase of, of this. So this voxel perhaps might encode when it's doing a lower saccadic eye movement, which is earlier in the cycle. Uh, we can color code this. So this voxel would be red representing that it cares about movements um, lowerly and into the lower field. Actual, fMRI, um, actual MRI data, we take eight quasi-axial slices across the superior colliculus at high resolution. 1.2 millimeters, and um, we developed a, a spiral sequence that samples case space in a more efficient way when we're actually doing the acquisition so we can get good data, higher signal noise ratio. We also take high resolution T1 data in this area, and so we can actually uh, measure this out. So then we make 3D surface representations of the brainstem, and ultimately we'll get a view like this where now you're looking behind the head here and down into the brainstem. And so if we think about what happened in the monkeys in the 1970s, that this medial lateral aspect of the superior colliculus is mapped in the inferior visual, inferior superior visual field, we should expect to see something like this, where, where we would see this. Of, of course, we're not going to see these exact distinct regions, and uh, because we're averaging over large areas of neural tissue, so we might see this more kind of gradient. And this is actually now, here's, here's actually my brain data here, so we can actually see that this representation of medial lateral aspects is represented here. And we can see this, we actually measure the eye movements while the patient is in, or while the subject is in the scanner, and we can actually correlate the, the phase of the eye movements with the fMRI data. And we can do this across several patients, and we can do this on both sides. So here's a, another uh, subject that's now having it on the, on, the, uh, on the other side, on the left superior colliculus. And we can do this on five different patients, and we see the general trends. So we're able to map this eye movement, and now we can say is that how is it organized? And how is it related to vision? So we can also stimulate the visual field in these classical ways. So we have this, we have these dots that are flashing that are stimulating your visual field in different chunks. And we can see what areas of the superior colliculus care about these parts of the visual field that are being stimulated. So again, we're gonna apply the same phase mapping techniques, but instead of doing it with eye movements, we're doing it with visual stimulation. And we can see that there's these eye movement maps that are generated. Um, that, that lie this. And then, and we can do this across all five patients and we actually generate even better data because visual information is, is that superficial layer. It's easier to, to measure and it generates a stronger fMRI response in general. But we can ask is that, how do I know that, that these maps are the same? Are they the same? Is that, are they retinotopically organized, the superficial layer and the intermediate layer in the same way? And we can basically do these population-based correlative analysis and even though these slopes are kind of weak, we can, with as much noise as there is in the data, we can kind of say that they are in alignment and they are registered each other. So there's, there's actually just one map and, and the brain is using that single map. And this is true hey, of the Ricky, monkeys. Yep. Uh, would you be able to wrap up in just the, the sure. last 30 seconds? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so the last thing I wanted to show you is that if we dig through the, the, the layers of superior colliculus, um, we can see that in the maps, the superficial layer map actually lies a little bit, um, uh, the saccadic map lies deeper than the superficial map. So that's, that's really what I want to show you. So ultimately, we, we can do this across patients, and we can see that um, we've, we've mapped the superior colliculus. We can see that they're in good alignment, and we can actually have these depth profiles. And um, I won't go into really the, the radiation oncology part, but really we're doing types of image processing that leverages these kinds of approaches to, to map tumors and, and understand 
uh, their physiology. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. And you know, this makes me feel like we need to have longer sessions for all of you after these lightning talks, because I think you're getting lots of interest. And last, not, uh, last but not least, we got Elizabeth Ricker, um, who uh, will, uh, she, so just a quick note, I'll let her int introduce herself and jump right in. Uh, but I do want to note that uh, it looks like she's got an upcoming book on cognitive enhancement, which is super interesting. It's called Smarter Tomorrow, How 15 Minutes of Neurohacking a Day Can Help You Work Better, Think Faster, and Get more done. So apparently this will share some spoils of her human guinea pigging adventures spanning the last 10 years. So I'm so curious to hear. Elizabeth, over to you. And for those of you with the questions for Ricky, please feel free to uh, message him directly. Elizabeth, you might be on. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, so thanks so much, Wendy. Um, it is true. I've got a book coming out later this year, um, and it is on cognitive enhancement. And I'm going to talk with you very briefly about that today. We probably won't have time for the self-experiment, but I will leave the link in the chat so that you guys can do that on your own time. And it will hopefully be a lot of fun and actually uh, provide some laughs for you. So uh, without further ado, let's dive in. So basically, the thing that I've been mildly obsessed with for the last 10 years is answering this question. So what if you had just 15 minutes a day and you only wanted to spend less than $500 and you actually wanted to enhance your cognition, what would you do? So, uh, and this is the topic of my book as well. Um, so to dive into that, I've, I first started getting excited about this back when I was an undergrad at MIT. And what I noticed was that uh, among my classmates, many people were intrigued at the idea of enhancing their learning and memory and optimizing their creativity. And then even after we graduated, that fascination continued, but it changed. So people became then interested in juggling their responsibilities with their families and with their careers. And now it wasn't about learning and memory. It was about um, emotional regulation and task switching. So people were still interested in cognitive enhancement, but the things that they wanted to do were a little bit different. So there was that, that change in focus over time. And what I became interested in, because I was also course nine, um, and I did a lot of research both at Harvard and MIT, was I wanted to know um, if a person really wants to enhance their cognition, they probably don't want to do just one thing. If they want to focus in on a specific target, uh, what can they do that will be a, a bit more individualized? So the problem right now is that if you don't actually have a brain disease, uh, your options are very confusing. Um, there's a lot of snake oil out there and it's not well regulated. So if you walk into a supermarket, you can go into the nutrition section and you'll find nutritional supplements that will claim that they're going to you know, offset uh, cognitive decline. And maybe they will, maybe they won't, but it's not regulated, right? So it's very hard to know what's real and what's worth your time. Um, the other major problem actually comes from the science itself. So there are tremendous differences within and across people. So what I mean by that is if you look in the field of connectomics, which is sort of an emerging field where we're using neuroimaging to look at the wiring within the brain, and we can sort of see how things hook up and detach neuron to neuron based on experience throughout your life, those changes within one person's lifetime, um, even year to year, you can see a 12% difference in one person year to year. But then if you look across people, uh, recently researchers have been looking at raw data that's um, ignoring the individual people and just trying to say, can we figure out who is who, not seeing, not seeing any personally identifiable information. And the truth is that the, the wiring patterns are actually usable as, um, as sort of fingerprints. So they're being looked into as um, actual uh, identifiable um, biometrics. So really the differences between people could be in, in this particular study that I'm thinking of, um, they were able to identify people with 100% accuracy. So that's how different the brain wiring is across people. So you can imagine that if you're thinking about interventions and treatments and things that you want to do to improve your brain performance, a one-size-fits-all strategy is clearly not going to work. So, okay, so now we've kind of figured out, we've laid out a lot of problems. Let's try to find some solutions. So if you dive into the literature, which I've been doing for uh, a long time, uh, close to 10 years now, um, is you want to first look at interventions that have been randomized control trial validated. So it's still not great because a lot of the sample sizes are small. 
but you pull from that and you look at what's promising. And I've done that and I pulled out the, the treatments that seem to be most useful and I include those in my book. Um, I'm not gonna spoil it, but there, there's some good ones. There's some things you've heard of and there's probably some weird ones that you've not heard of. Um, but then the next question is, if you just wanna spend 15 minutes a day, less than $500, you don't wanna use a prescription, that narrows the options significantly. And the reason I'm, I'm being um, strict about that is because if you're just a kind of relatively healthy person, you don't have a disease, you probably don't wanna spend more than 15 minutes a day doing this. It's not worth your time. So I'm trying to be more pr practical uh, for people here. And then finally the question is, how are you actually going to test whether this stuff works for you? So you, you don't have the benefits of being part of a randomized controlled trial. Um, you don't have wonderful people like Irina to include you in, um, in a research study necessarily. You actually have just yourself. But the beauty is you can actually run a self-experiment and you will use a different set of methods than you typically would if you were part of a, a large group study, but you can actually come to some very compelling um, conclusions because although you have a supposedly small N, you have exactly the right subject, you have yourself. So you actually can take many samples if you use things like wearables and apps and you really engage in the quantified self to get lots and lots of data on yourself and your cognition over time. So uh, the, the rationale behind this little picture here is George Church is a faculty member at Harvard Medical School um, and he's one of many esteemed scientists who actually engage in self-experimentation. So I'm trying to let you know that you won't be alone if you decide to human guinea pig. Um, many Nobel Prize winners actually uh, did their most pioneering work through self-experimentation initially. Uh, and uh, George Church is trying out a COVID vaccine on himself. So that's pretty wild, but wild things have been tried in this, in this area. Um, okay, so again, we don't have time to do the experiment, but I will include the link. Um, the sort of gist of this is what you'll be doing is you'll target a specific mental target, which in this case is mood. Um, and mood has a, a significant effect on a lot of different aspects of cognition. Um, one of the big ones is actually creativity and mood are quite connected, but mood really affects um, many abilities, including even executive function um, and certainly emotional regulation and others. Um, this is a laughter intervention. So more on that if you click on, on the link later. Um, so yeah, I think we're almost out of time. So I'm just gonna um, summarize. Um, I'm so excited to be sharing self-experimentation with you guys and um, neurohacking. And there's such a wonderful glut of uh, beautiful science that's growing in this field. Um, my grad school advisor at Harvard um, started a whole uh, discipline called the science of the individual. Um, and there's just a lot of exciting research coming out of both education and neuroscience. But all that being said, you can actually do this stuff at home. So you can start running self-experiments on yourself. Um, my book details both the interventions that have been better vetted that you can try relatively safely at home and do have uh, decent promising results on them and exactly how to run a self-experiment so that you don't get fooled by, um, by noise and statistical errors um, and think that, think, think that something is working for you when it's really not or don't run an experiment long enough and, and um, as a result, um, not think that something is working even when it actually could be helping you. So um, I think that's all the time I have, but um, I'm super excited to answer questions and I hope you uh, decide to take the self-experiment and uh, join, join in neurohacking. And um, stay in touch, my website thank is neuroeducate.com. Thank you so much, thank Elizabeth. You, and thank you, uh, Wendy and all the other speakers for uh, today's neuroscience talks. Um, we're running a tiny bit late, so I'm going to go ahead and transfer to the next session. Thank you.